This is VOA Africa. Hello, I'm Esther Gidu Yort. It's Monday, July 27th. This is Africa 54. Due to the global outbreak of COVID-19, Voice of America is taking every necessary precaution to safeguard its employees. So our broadcast will look a little different today and in the near future as we, out of an abundance of caution, reduce our staffing at VOA headquarters here in Washington. We're working to help keep you informed about what's going on and we appreciate you staying with us on Africa 54. Somalia's parliament over the weekend ousted Prime Minister Hassan Ali Khaire as his simmering power struggle with the President Mohamed Abdullahi Mohamed reached a tipping point. David Doyle has our story. Somalia's Prime Minister Hassan Ali Khaire was ousted on Saturday as a simmering power struggle between him and the country's president culminated in a no-confidence vote. Kaire and President Mohamed Abdullahi Mohamed have been tussling over whether to delay a national election due in February next year, with the Prime Minister insisting it go ahead and the President favouring a postponement. The President's allies have also accused Kaire of failing to stabilise the security situation in the country. The Horn of Africa nation has been holding elections through representatives for the past decade because of insecurity caused by Al-Shabaab militants in most areas. And the Speaker of the Parliament, Mohamed Mursal Sheikh Abdirahman, said Kaire's government had failed on its promise on the preparation of a clear plan for the one-man, one-vote election. Mohamed Abukar Islo, the internal security minister and a key ally of Kaire, called it a dark day, accusing the Speaker and the President of plotting to remove the Prime Minister to extend their terms. President Mohamed elevated Deputy Prime Minister Mahdi Mohamed Guled to Prime Minister in an acting capacity, a statement issued by his office said, citing the need for continuity of government programs. That was David Doyle of Reuters reporting. The recent death of popular Ethiopian musician Hakalu Hundesa heightened ethnic tensions in the nation. It sparked violent demonstrations around the Ababa which quickly spread to the Oromia region, where Hundesa was born. At least 160 people died. Authorities blocked the internet and arrested dozens of people, including a prominent media mogul and government critic, Jawal Mohammed. Africa 54's managing editor, Vincent Makori, spoke with Bileni Sayum, the spokesperson for Ethiopian Prime Minister Abe Ahmed, and asked her to respond to accusations that the government had a hand in the death of Hundesa. It's uh, quite a preposterous um, um, accusation uh, that is uh, being uh, put towards the government in terms of um, involvement um, in that. Um, I mean, there are certain groups, obviously, that would perpetuate this uh, wrong uh, narrative, but a majority of Ethiopians do understand uh, that uh, this is a wrong narrative that is being perpetuated uh, because the government has got no reason or no cause um, at all. Um, to do anything uh, this uh, disruptive. Um, because you've seen after uh, Hajjami's untimely death um, and uh, killing, um, the situation, the way that it evolved into a loss of many lives, into uh, destruction of a lot of property, um, it's like that have gone down uh, to ashes in a matter of moments that have been accumulated over time. Um, there is no reason for the government to do that to itself. So there are clear... Um, linkages um, and the, the perpetrators have also come forward um, and confessed so um, how in terms of how the government is dealing with this it's by ensuring and maintaining the rule of law and bringing uh, forth all of those that are accountable in relation to the um, killing of Hachalu but as well as with all of the other disruptive um, um, uh, scenarios and uh, incidents that took place, holding people accountable and uh, bringing them to justice as well. Now, one of the reasons why some may be led to believe that that is a possibility that the government can do that is because according to human rights reports, there have been so many extrajudicial killings of people, especially in the Western or Oromia area, um, abduction of young university students and disappearance of some of the uh, Oromo uh, opposition leaders. Uh, how, how can you explain that? 
Well, uh, with regards to that, I think uh, we need to have a bit of a perspective with regards to context, because I um, I think in terms of uh, reporting, um, again, uh, this is a critical work that human rights organizations are doing, but it also needs to be founded on context and uh, really understanding the dynamics and the uh, complex political environment at play. Um, as you would recall, 2.5 um, years ago, when uh, the new administration came into the fore, it came with uh, um, huge sweeping reforms, um, not just introducing them or just not mentioning them, but there were a series of reforms that took uh, place within a uh, span of a very short period of time. Um, these reforms have been uh, the backbone of or the foundation for the democratization path and process that Ethiopia is on. Uh, part of these reforms um, have also looked at the very uh, repressive nature of the previous regime and the previous political environment uh, that Ethiopia has been part of. So really looking back and um, uh, laying the foundation uh, for all of the ills that had been inherited from the previous administration as well and the repressive nature um, where a lot of political parties, a lot of media entities and a lot of individuals um, had been imprisoned for their political consciousness and for their political activism and the views that they held. So a key component of this administration's um, reforms, particularly in the political arena, has been um, opening the playing field, uh, making it wide open, inviting all of um, those that had been brandished by the previous regime under a terrorism act um, to come into the country and engage in a peaceful struggle. So this has included this uh, also this invitation has included um, uh, political parties that were engaged in armed struggle for several years. They were asked to come back into the country, lay down their arms, and engage peacefully. Um, the same thing for media entities. So many political parties have also come and are engaging uh, in that peaceful process. But there are some elements who have not. Let me let me just wrap up my thought here. But there are some elements that have not done that as well, and instead have taken and resorted back to their previous ways of engaging um, in terrorizing communities as well. Some are saying the same tactics that were used before, the same tactics that actually led to the fall of the previous coalition uh, are the same that are being used. I mean, would you deny that at this time, uh, the internet is being shut down, not only in the Western Oromia, but in entire Ethiopia, which was an ish, a tactic that was used before. Uh, would you deny that opposition leaders are having a hard time? For example, Jawar Mohammed has been a number of times arrested or his house just barricaded. There's also the disappearance. Up to now, nobody knows where Abdi Regasa is. Uh, can those be denied at this point? Um, Vincent, I mean, I'm not entirely sure uh, where the information, as far as I'm concerned, I don't know of any instances where Jawar Mohammed has been um, arrested before. Um, the arrest that took place recently um, uh, in, in relation to the incident is not necessarily um, anything related to political um, activism or uh, political thought. It is purely an incident that's attached with the um, unlawful hijacking of Hajj Alu's remains against the wishes of his family to be buried in Ambo town. So against the Kubir's um, accusation and their suspects, um, according to what the Attorney General has put forth and the police have put, have put forth, these arrests have been done uh, because of their involvement in uh, incidents uh, that put the constitutional order into threat. So I wouldn't say there are the same tactics are being used to repress individuals' rights. They are not tactics that are being used um, to um, to take uh, political uh, action against um, people that are voicing different concerns and ideas. With regards to the internet that you talk about, the internet has already been partially restored. And um, I've said this before as well, the internet is a powerful tool, it's a necessary communication tool. It's a tool for development, but it's also a tool that can be utilized by certain groups to create havoc, like we have seen um, on the fortnight after Hajalu's death. So there was a lot of um, incitement of hate, um, vitriol, um, inciting people to go out and actually um, undertake all of these destructive efforts or destructive um, tactics on uh, property, damaging property and damaging lives. And there were calls for communal, ethnic and religious violence that were being spread through social media. Um, using the internet by individuals that are sitting in the comforts of their homes, uh, removed from the reality in North America and Europe. So the internet has also a very dark side that we all need to acknowledge and put it into context. That was Africa 54 Managing Editor Vincent Makori speaking with Bileni Seyum, spokesperson for Ethiopian Prime Minister Abe Ahmed, 
In part two of the interview, Sayum responds to the accusations that the government is still using old repressive tactics against its citizens. The Oromo are the single largest ethnic group in Ethiopia and East Africa, comprising more than 35% of Ethiopia's 100 million people. For years, the Oromos have protested what they say are years of discrimination and injustice. According to Amnesty International, the government has often responded with overwhelming and disproportionate force, unleashing a vicious cycle of protests and totally avoidable bloodshed. Africa 54's managing editor Vincent McCory recently spoke with Henok Gabisa, co-chair International Oromo Lawyers Association, and asked him about the grievances of the Oromo people. Historically speaking, uh, the way the country was built was completely on uh, the narrative of a single uh, type of, of politics and uh, system that had never cared to include the Oromo in the center or in the national project. So that had overflown uh, decades and had now spilled over effect into what we have currently, where uh, the Oromos were never allowed to self-rule. Uh, they were never allowed to elect their own leaders. Up until today, uh, the Oromos were never allowed to have their language be uh, used to serve them at the federal uh, level despite the fact that the Oromos are the majority in the country. Uh, so it's an embarrassing kind of situation to have to be uh, uh, a majority and still requesting or asking the government to have your language to be the federal, a co-language or a co-official language at the federal level. Mm -hmm. These are some of the things that we can just pull off of our, 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 uh, our mind. The government side said, there have been so many efforts over time, and especially under the new administration, to bring everybody to the table. But that there are people who are basically anarchists who do not want to come to the table to discuss. And, and so the accusation is that some of you are not willing to come and resolve these issues peacefully. That's uh, an utter dismissal of a legitimate question. Uh, I would like to bring to your attention uh, the fact that uh, a few months ago that the opposition figures who trusted the reform, who trusted the change, and they went back home, and they went to play a positive role in the democratization process of the entire country. But they were systematically and blatantly out uh, 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 sidelined. And we can take, for example, the, uh, the COVID-19 situation and how that plays into the election. Yes, it was necessary to postpone election, but postponement of election is a bipartisan national project. It's not, it's not a decision that only had to be taken by a single uh, political party. The opposition uh, figures who left diaspora, went back home, requested the government to sit at the table, discuss about the future of their country, discuss how to postpone election, make it uh, a bipartisan decision, we're not allowed, right? But, so but uh, uh, when, when we asked uh, the spokesperson of the government, uh, uh, Billy Nesayuma, uh, the same question, uh, why the opposition was not included in the decision to postpone the election due to COVID-19, she said, in fact, the opposition was involved, that it was uh, a decision made after consultation between the electoral body uh, the government side and opposition, and that perhaps uh, some of us didn't have the facts right. That's a national lie. As a co-chair of International Oromo Lawyers Association, we're not a political party. The, uh, the Constitutional Inquiry Council uh, published a call for expertise opinion, and Oromo lawyers, in and out, got together, prepared amicus curie to support their decision to provide expertise and just because we had an Oromo name on our brief of Amiki, we got undermined and we were not allowed to be part of even at the expertise level, let alone at the political leaders level. At the expertise level, anything that carried the Oromo name was rejected on the record. In fact, uh, uh, one of the things that has baffled many people is that uh, uh, the prime minister, the current prime minister, has... Uh, 
has an Oromo connection. He ha is partly Oromo. And many thought that uh, him coming in, he has he has uh, some level of sensitivity towards the issue. Uh, what has been the frustration, the cause of frustration under the current administration? A prime minister who has actually received a lot of praise internationally, including a, a, a Nobel Prize. True, true. Uh, everyone in and out supported the prime minister. All people from all walks of life wanted the prime minister to be successful. The opposition, the pro-government, the anti-government all came together, hoping that the country would move forward. This did not uh, long last, right? So you mentioned about the prime minister having an Oromo background. For one thing, I would answer this in two different ways. For one thing, the Oromo people did not request to have a prime minister in office. The main question of the Oromo people was to have the chance to elect their own leaders. So it does not matter who you have in the prime minister office, that can be a holder of the office. The primary demand is someone who believes in the question, the legitimate question of democratization, self-rule, respect for collective dignity and existence of the Oromo people. That's what the Oromo people, and for that matter, other nations and nationalities wanted. Here, in our case, the prime minister came to power. He has never been elected. The Oromo people care about real and genuine democracy, about reconciliation. And this is a prime minister who has not been elected. So the fact that he has an Oromo background, or he has an Oromo father or Oromo mother, does not matter. That was Africa 54 managing editor Vincent McCory speaking with Henok Gabisa, co-chair International Oromo Lawyers Association. Still to come, a documentary immortalizes an American civil rights icon. Stay with us. Hello, I'm Lina Mudu, your VOA health correspondent. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the World Health Organization says there are currently no drugs licensed for the treatment or prevention of COVID-19. And there is no proof that hydroxychloroquine or any other drug can cure or prevent coronavirus. The misuse of hydroxychloroquine can cause serious side effects, illness, and even lead to death. For more information on COVID-19, visit who.int or contact your local or national health authorities. Welcome back to Africa 54. The onslaught of COVID-19 is continuing to devastate major parts of the United States. The U.S. leads the world in the number of confirmed infections with more than 4.2 million and on Sunday added 55,000 new cases and more than 500 deaths, according to Johns Hopkins University data. The southeastern state of Florida, which is among the leaders in a surge in cases this month, added 9,300 cases of its own on Sunday to move into second place among U.S. states. Only California, with a much higher population, has more. Just behind Florida are New York and Texas. Now to Africa, where Morocco began stopping people entering and leaving some of its biggest cities at midnight in an effort to contain a surge in COVID-19 cases. Those cities include Casablanca, Tangier, Marrakech, Fez and Meknes, according to Reuters. The nation's health ministry on Sunday said 633 new COVID-19 infections were recorded, lifting the total number of confirmed cases to over 20,000 with 313 deaths. But more than 16,000 people have recovered from the disease. The Moroccan government says it has carried out over 1 million tests and has made mask wearing mandatory. A few weeks ago, researchers at Oxford University announced promising results from early trials of their version of a COVID-19 vaccine. In early trial results, on just over 1,000 volunteers, the vaccine appeared to be safe and triggered an immune response. VOA spoke with one volunteer who has participated in the phase two of trials. VOA's Dino Jahic reports and NRI's narrates our story. The entire world is working to find an effective vaccine to fight the COVID pandemic. Currently, there are nearly 150 different vaccines in various stages of production. 
but just about a dozen are in expanded human trials. One of those vaccines is being produced at Oxford University. Branko Rittman volunteered to be part of those trials. I couldn't see myself contributing in any other meaningful way because I'm not a health professional. I don't work in a hospital. I'm not a nurse. Um, and I think that vaccine is the possibly the only way for us to get back to normal and to manage to live with this virus in a way that is not hurting our economy, that is not separating people. The trials involved receiving a shot about six weeks ago and then constant monitoring. I did a blood test after one month and then the next blood test is going to be after three months, then six months and then a year in which they're testing whether I have antibodies in my bloodstream. Uh, other than that, I'm testing myself with a regular PCR swab test uh, every week. One interesting element of the trials for Ritman is that a number of volunteers didn't actually receive the vaccine, but a placebo. The placebo vaccine that, I, that was being given uh, to 50% of the people is an actual meningitis vaccine uh, that we get in childhood usually. Um, so I don't know if I got the meningitis vaccine or not, but it's a real vaccine. Um, so I don't know if I got that one or the, the COVID one, but they've asked me to behave normally as if I would had I not gotten the vaccine. So far, Rittman says he's had no side effects and that he's proud to be part of these trials. I haven't seen my parents for six months. There's a lot of people who haven't seen their uh, elderly members of family. So anything that could be done to hasten the, the solution, I think it's everybody's duty to try and contribute. Experts say it is possible a vaccine could start to become available for human use late this year or early next year. Anna Rice for VOA News, Washington. With more than 4 million confirmed cases of COVID-19 across the U.S., many states are pausing their reopening efforts, leaving those who remain unemployed unsure about their future. Senate Republicans are planning to introduce another coronavirus relief bill this week. Isha Sarai reports. Confirmed cases of the novel coronavirus are surging across the United States, particularly in the southeast. We, we're finding more cases because we're testing more, but indeed what we need to do is make sure that we focus on those nursing homes, long-term care, so that we can bring that death uh, uh, count down uh, because those are the ones that are most at risk. Health experts say increased testing is just one factor in the number of new infections, and officials in many states have criticized the overall federal response to the virus. We are at the mercy of what's going on around the country. No national strategy, no public health investment. It start with it's a hoax. It is the worst abdication of a national response and responsibility to protect Americans I've ever seen in my government career. As many states pause reopening plans grappling with new spikes in virus cases, the roughly 11% of Americans who are unemployed worry that a new coronavirus relief package will not be passed in time for them to pay their bills. Republicans in the Senate are slated to unveil the new plan this week, but tough negotiations lie ahead with Democrats. We are going to be prepared on Monday to provide unemployment uh, insurance extension uh, that would be 70 percent of whatever the wages you were uh, prior to uh, being unemployed, uh, that it would reimburse you for up to 70 percent of those wages, uh, hopefully as a way to get people back on their feet. The current $600 per week benefit is expiring at the end of the week, and the new Republican proposal will sharply reduce the total amount. Democratic leaders have pushed for maintaining the $600 weekly benefit. Isha Sarai, VOA News, Washington. For over a century, civil rights icon John Lewis made history fighting for desegregation and for the right to vote in the U.S. Don Porter's documentary, John Lewis, Good Trouble, chronicles his life of activism. VOA's Penelope Fulu has more. My philosophy is very simple. When you see something that is not right, not fair, yeah. not just, Something. Yeah. Do something. Get in trouble. Good trouble. Necessary trouble. The late congressman's lifelong struggle for civil rights in America is chronicled in Don Porter's documentary, John Lewis, Good Trouble. 
We're marching today to dramatize to the world that hundreds and thousands of Negro citizens denied the right to vote. Using rare archival footage, the documentary highlights Lewis's more than 60 years of social activism. In 1963, he was one of the organizers of the March on Washington. In 1965, he helped lead a nonviolent march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Montgomery, Alabama, against segregation and for the right to vote. There, armed Alabama police attacked the peaceful demonstrators, including Lewis, in a day that became known as Bloody Sunday. I was hit in the head. My knees went from under me. I thought I was going to down the bridge. Hours before Lewis's death on July 17th, the documentary's executive producer, Eric Alexander, spoke to VOA about Lewis's political convictions and personality. He knows that the most powerful nonviolent tool for change in any movement, especially in that, is the right to vote. So he works hard to defend it. He protects that right for everybody. He's a person who doesn't get pessimistic because he understands that America, as an idea, is um, a gift. Using current interviews and footage, Don Porter's documentary shows how the late civil rights icon continued until the end to provide the blueprint for a transparent and fair legislative process for voting rights, for health care reform, for immigration and gun control. You cannot replace a John Lewis. He's the most courageous person I ever met. Too many people struggled and died to make it possible for every American to exercise their right to vote. He challenges the conscience of the Congress. During the 2014 screening of Ava DuVernay's biopic, Selma, on the Selma to Montgomery marches, Lewis spoke to VOA about the power of peaceful resistance. We were willing to be beaten, willing to be jailed, willing to suffer to gain the right to participate in a democratic process. We literally put our bodies on the line. And Selma have changed America forever. Uh, you, you speak to President Carter, uh, President Clinton, uh, President Obama, had been for Selma and a bridge. These three men probably wouldn't have been elected president. As for seeing his younger self, portrayed by actor Stephen James in Selma. I wanted to say to the actor, I want my backpack back. I, I, I really want my trench coat. Uh, young, it took me back to the time when I was only 20, 21, 23, 24, 25, when I walked across that bridge with that backpack, my trench coat, I had all of my hand a few pounds lighter. There are forces in America today want to take us back, but we're not going back. We're going forward. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com from all of us here in Washington. Thank you for watching.